So, welcome. Uh, I'm Dan Baldwin. I'm the president of the Community Foundation for Monterey County. And the Community Foundation has been engaged in an ongoing discussion around homelessness uh, very actively for about four years. And we have been doing this through conversations with providers, home service providers, through governmental entities, with the donor community. And I think one of the, the overriding challenges of the very beginning has been the ability to have people feel like there's a sense of coordination and um, rallying around in an aligned way some kind of shared vision. And I don't know that we're going to necessarily achieve that uh, this evening, but, uh, but this, this is one of those important stepping stones uh, to being able to achieve that. I think we all agree that uh, we have, we, we sort of owe it not only to our communities at large, but to people who struggle, struggle with homelessness, whether it be um, chronic homelessness due to uh, mental health or addiction issues, or whether it be homelessness through the circumstances of a loss of job, uh, in illness, death of a spouse, uh, domestic abuse. Uh, the deeper you go into this topic, the more that you learn that there is not a, a single reason or a single definition for what describes uh, homelessness or what causes homelessness. That also gets to the complexity of finding solutions. And uh, so this is going to be an interesting uh, conversation this evening. Uh, I do want to make sure that this is, uh, we, from the outset, know that this is a, uh, it's a back and forth, it's a community discussion. Uh, it, is a, it is surrounding uh, you know, the impetus is having to do with funding, but, but no decisions are going to get made at this meeting. Uh, there is a separate process uh, for how uh, applications for heat funding are going to get made. Uh, there's a request for proposals going to be going out. There's another a body, the Leadership Council, which is going to make uh, ultimately make those decisions. But this, this is part of the, the community process, the input process, is going to help inform uh, how we can, as a, as a community, and by a community, obviously, in our community, uh, responsibly go forward. So when, uh, when Wendy asked about holding it here, uh, the meeting here, I said, well, you know, we do have some space limitations. And it looks like we just sort of just filled the room, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get everybody to feel comfortable and we won't have too many more show up. It's not like we lose one more, but we have so much space. So, the uh, restrooms are down the hallway behind uh, the guy in the blue shirt, and that's Brian there. And it's blue from here, Brian. And so, the men's room is right here, the ladies' room, you just go down and then you make a, a left. There, there's, there's signage there for that. Okay. Uh, I want to thank, uh, clearly, uh, Supervisors uh, Jane Parker and Mary Adams uh, for their leadership here. And uh, this is their, this meeting is really their doing. And I think it's, uh, I'm just going to throw bias in here. I just think it's, uh, it's great leadership on the part of our elected officials that this kind of discussion is going on in a public forum, in a neutral setting and giving everybody the opportunity to provide input. And, uh, and so thank you both for that. And we'll be hearing, we'll be hearing from them also uh, as this goes on. Uh, also, uh, Assemblymember Mark Stone is represented uh, by Alex O'Gordy. Alex Manis. Manis. Hi, Alex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to the reading class, this is for a sec there. But thank you for being here. Uh, sorry, we haven't met yet, but thank you for being here. Um, uh, so, two people that want to say something before we uh, really launch in. Uh, one is uh, Mayor Joe Gunther, Mayor of Salinas. I can tell you that um, 
over the course of being involved in these homeless convers home conversations around homelessness <coughs> here and in Salinas and elsewhere, uh, Mayor Gunter has uh, done a remarkable job of uh, engaging and educating himself on the complexities. Uh, so, and Joe, you can come up front, you can see up there, we usually don't use mics here, but it just seemed like we got a full room. And then he is going to introduce Sam Farr, or turn it over to Sam Farr, who also will say a few things. Thank you. First of all, I want to tell you right now, these two supervisor ladies have more courage than some of my council members. <laughs> meetings and they jumped right in and the whole board of supervisors but for them on the peninsula this is a courageous move on their part to address one of the hardest issues but when I walked into the room tonight it was so positive in here the energy level was very high and everybody's looking for answers solutions and want to help their community and I could feel that when I walked in trust me you don't always agree at public meetings but I feel it when I walk in here that the people here care about their community and the people. And, and I think you all deserve, you know, you're just, that's outstanding. And what's going on here is, it's an issue that we don't have all the answers, but we're working on it very diligently. And for government entities to try to figure out how to make this work, this is something that we're not very good at because we've never had to do it before. But I think what you see is a very strong feeling in this room tonight. Some people don't want the homeless. I've had that conversation just recently, and I'm glad they're not here tonight because you don't need anybody to bring the meeting down. You need to come up with solutions and answers that work for the whole community. And I think you can do that as a community. And I think I grew up in Marina. My father was in the Army in Fort Worth. I spent a lot of time in Monterey. And if they were alive, they'd be very proud of the fact people on the peninsula care about each other. So I want to thank you for being here tonight, just keep the energy level up. And if you have a new solution, make sure you tell them because they'll let me know what I need to do. And you're doing a great job. Sam, come on up. This is a problem. He normally Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. And Doug, thank you for hosting this. Thank you, Jane, thank you very much for your leadership. This is, a, this is a tough issue, and I spent 40 years in elective office at the local level, and state level, and federal level. And, um, I, I, I saw a continuing failing of the ability to politically address the need for housing. When I grew up on the Monterey Peninsula, you lived in the town you worked in. I grew up in Carmel. Everybody who worked in Carmel, the hotels and the low-income offices, lived in Carmel. Uh, I know that because my father was the first <coughs> lawyer in Seaside and my friends in school asking why my father couldn't get a job in Carmel. <laughs> 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 he couldn't, so he could go to the law in Seaside. But I've been passionate about the fact that we are losing our communities because we are failing to allow the only authority that exists in law to control our communities, which is our zoning authority. They aren't controlled by the state of California or the government in Washington, D.C. And so I'm passionately, I mean, I came into politics because of the war on poverty, came out of the Peace Corps, and came back to Monterey County, and really wanted to start solving the problems and realize that, that the culture of poverty that I learned about in the Peace Corps can only be solved at the local level. So here are some suggestions. These are tough issues. And I'd like to say that you cannot assign these problems or blame them on the lack of funding from federal government or state government. <coughs> the authority here to solve this problem is in the elected politics. Planning commissions can't solve it. Housing authorities can't solve it. It's got to be in the guts of the people that we elect to office. Unfortunately, we have some people with some good guts tonight to begin with. <laughs> so here's my suggestions. Talk about this. We need to really um, Make sure that all the cities in this county, and the county itself, have a percentage of inclusion zoning required. They all have to have housing elements. Those housing elements have to be approved by the state housing authority. I think there's a lot of weaknesses in those housing uh, elements. 
Those weaknesses can be pursued by a legal authority to shut down the permitting authority, to shut down getting uh, planning, uh, housing permits, building permits, uh, until those housing elements are complete, and until they're being implemented. And so by hearing, by requiring, I remember one time, I think Salinas had the highest, which was 30% of all housing that was going to be built, all the units that were going to be built, had to be marketed, and we call below market. And, and, and it's not a homeless matter of housing, it's a, it's a workforce housing. And so the beginning is for the county to go on record is look, our authorities in the county and our relationships with our communities is only going to be continued as long as there are you have adopted. Carmel has an incredible housing element. I read the whole thing, there's not one requirement that any percentage of housing has to be there. So there's no measurement tool of whether you're achieving your goals. Um, second is that we need a new process of transparency. I was really glad that the county had the guts to require Pebble Beach, because they always came to the county and said, you want us to build this affordable housing, workforce housing in Pebble Beach, we'll do it. But we'll also give you money, more than you can imagine, to build a housing in Casterville or Chula or someplace else. <laughs> and we set up a fund to do that when I was on the board of supervisors. That housing never got built. Because the Casterville's and Chula said, you know, why are you dumping it all on us? So the money was in the bank, and the uh, property was never uh, built, bought, or uh, housing built. So we need a, a and, 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 and my criticism of, of it, and I'm not sure that I have all the details right, but they were building that housing for uh, low-income employees to solve a commute problem. But where was the public uh, uh, transparency that the people that are actually living in those housing do meet those income levels? And I would insist that all of the government entities here have a one-stop or, or other stop, but that there is a transparent, public available entity to say, okay, people who qualify will have to be certified. We do that now with the Housing Authority, the Monterey County Housing Authority, and I think the City of Monterey also does it. But I'm not sure that we, we do that with all the development where we require developers to have inclusion. Carmel transfers it to, to the Carmel Foundation, but there's no transparency. So this, this uh, whether people are really qualified to be uh, a lower uh, medium income ought to be done in a kind of public transparency way. I think the other thing is that we're going to about to have new water when the peace hall begins. That water, uh, the county ought to take a stand, and the city ought to take a stand, that the priority of that water is going to go to housing of low and moderate income people. We don't need more visitor. <coughs> Uh, you know, in Carmel, they're buying all the houses. I think the city of Carmel is very derelict. They just had the, the, the El Paso Water Company able to do a lot of spec homes with the water they bought. Not one of those things required that those homes be uh, affordable. So I think your water allocations you ought to prioritize uh, for for uh, incentives to do affordable housing. I think you ought to use your dues, county supervisors, to handbags and to you, are, you fund LAFCO, and you have other authorities, and you want to ask your CPO for all of the contract authorities and MOU authorities where you put money into it, and you want to tag that money in your budget process, then we're going to have a conditionality that that money's done as long as those entities can be responsible for reporting back to us on the success of affording affordable housing. Uh, AMBAG ought to be able to, they, they do a, a survey, but they don't uh, have to really see whether by, by jurisdiction um, they have these ingredients like a percentage of affordability and that they're actually getting the houses done. I, the politics of this is you're just going to have to tell developers, we can't afford to wait for public money because it's going to happen. The Pebble Beach uh, properties did not get funded by outside sources. They got funded by the company. They got the privilege of, of doing their master plan and doing the implementation of that on the condition that they built housing for their workforce. They did it on their own dime. We ought to require all private sector development to do something on affordability on their own dime. San Francisco has certainly pushed that to the limits. I think, um, um, and then you ought to encourage through those contracts, and I'll finish up here, Waivers. They want to look at the fast track process that you can create by waiving uh, all things, as we do in emergencies. Emergencies, the 
when we've cleaned up the highway and Big Sur, it's always been under emergencies. We get the job done in record time. And this county ought to think about maybe declaring an emergency for housing, as mm -hmm. the president wants to declare for the border, and um, <laughs> use that authority to fast track. <coughs> Lastly, public entities ought to be responsible for um, the housing in, in their district. School districts ought to be providing housing for their employees as park districts, fire districts, water and sewer districts. Florida needs to enforce the master plan out at Fort Ord, which requires that you have workforce housing, that that housing be for people who are actually working at Fort Ord. So thank you very much for the time. I'm sorry to be a the party. <laughs> you ever as the skunk at the party. Thank you for bringing a very strong uh, message of reality to us. Um, so I have a couple of opportunities to, uh, to date right now. I'm going to introduce all the elected officials that we have here with us today. And one of the great things about that is that it echoes what Sam had said. It has to be us. We are the people who have the ability and we are the people who need the strength and we're the people who you can look to to ensure that we resolve this issue. This is not rocket science. We're better than the way we're, we're working now. I have just a quick aside. I'm not going to be a skunk, I promise. But I feel like it's old one week because all of those years at United Way, I had the opportunity to work with so many of you over the years, so I can't stop smiling. But at any rate, here we go. So I'm going to ask you please to hold your applause until the end. But I want just to let you know how many elected people we have were here with us. We have Dave Pacheco from Seaside City Council. We have John Wizard. John Wizard from Seaside City Council. We have Lisa Berkeley from Marina. Here we go. Thank you. Um, I've already mentioned, I've already seen John Gunter. He's in the back now. We have Dr. Betty West from Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. Um, we have Alana Miles from who is the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District trustee. Thank you. We have Wendy Ruth Askew, also from the Royal University of High School District. We have the amazing Gary Anderson, who we going to say, thank you, trustee of the Monterey Peninsula College Board. We also have Harvey Kuffner, who is the Monterey County Office of Education trustee. Oh, my son, there he is. Um, we have Mayor Marianne Gordon from the city of uh, Salinas, uh, excuse me, city of uh, uh, San City. Uh, we already mentioned Sam, and we've already mentioned Alec uh, Manis, who is representative to Assemblymember Marstone. Uh, before I turn it over to Jake, I just want to be sure that everyone signed in at the back, and please try to make your name legible because we want to be able to keep track of everybody um, who's here tonight so that we're able to uh, encourage the communication among ourselves. There's snacks over uh, by Grant, and uh, there we have it. It's a real pleasure now to turn the microphone over to the one who's really got the courage. She sat on the Board of Supervisors as the only woman for a long time. So at any rate, thank you so much for your leadership and all you do, Jane. Thank you. Thanks, yes. Mary. And I really appreciate uh, Mary being on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we, uh, on this uh, issue of homelessness and housing, um, we uh, put our heads together and said, you know, we represent the Monterey Peninsula. We need to start uh, inviting the uh, other elected officials, the, uh, the cities, to step up because it's this this um, set of issues is true in every single jurisdiction um, in our county. And so I'm um, really pleased that we're here talking about some uh, some solutions that can happen right here on the Monterey Peninsula. So, uh, as Dan Baldwin has already said, this is an informational meeting. It's relatively informal. We're trying to get uh, information to you about what is going on. Some of it we know about, and some of it we're going to find out tonight. Um, there are no decisions being made here. There will be a, um, there is a handout. Um, is it on their uh, seats? Um, so, and someone will be going through uh, what the process is for applying for this heat money. There we are. Um, so we're just trying to get as much information out to you and uh, from you to us as, as possible. There are cards on your chairs, or should be, uh, that you can use to ask questions. 
Um, if something occurs to you as the uh, presentations are going on, please feel free to write your question down. If it's one where you want to be sure you get an answer um, and you want us to follow up with you, be sure to put your name and your contact information so that we can um, do that. Um, let's see. So what I'd like to do just a quick thing um, to see uh, where, you know, sort of who's in the room. Normally when I do these kinds of meetings, I, you know, we go around and we say who we are and where we're from, um, but we're not going to do that tonight because we want to hear about some of these things. So let's just say um, uh, how many people here live in Carmel? Good. Thank you. Car or Carmel area, shall we say. Um, Pacific Grove? Good. We got PG in the house. Monterey? Woohoo! Go Woo Monterey. Monterey. All right. uh, Sand City? All right. <laughs> Seaside? All right. Woo Woo Seaside. Uh, Delray Oaks? Yes. Um, let's see, where am I? Uh, Marina? All right. Good, good Marina contingent. That's great. Um, and let's see, our, let's see, what are Unincorporated area, so Carmel Valley, Carmel Highlands, Fort Ord. Okay, good. We got got some unincorporated folks. That's good. Loose. Uh, uh, how many people here um, are service providers in some way? You either work for a service provider or you're the head of something or other. Okay, good. Oh yeah, good crew. Great. Well, I really appreciate all of you being here. Um, and I want to uh, get us into the, the meat of the, of the program. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to hear from Henry Espinoza um, to talk about the results of the 2017 census. And are you going to make a call for the 2019 census as well? And I see you. You didn't cover silliness. So, I'm so sorry. Of course, I did not. Of course, we are talking about the Monterey Peninsula. But yes, who's here from Salinas? <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, pretty good, pretty good people. Henry, take it away. Thank you, Supervisor Parker. And um, as both Supervisor Parker and Supervisor Adams um, have shared, we're very um, interested in, in hearing from people and for the information to be shared and for us all to be on the same page. Um, I am Henry Espinosa, and I'm the Acting Director for the Monterey County Department of Social Services. I've been in this role for about five months, and I've been with the county for about 35 years. So I've worked in a whole variety of, um, of, of assignments in social services. Tonight, I'm here to quickly share with you some information from the most recent homeless survey. It's called the Homeless Census. Um, and everyone should have a handout um, that's the executive summary. No. Lots of information. No. 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 Raise your hands, please. The homeless census it is a very important um, aspect of uh, providing homeless services and identifying the homeless needs there are. It's the way that the um, communities across the country, every two years, document homeless um, individuals in all the communities. And so it's a, a very comprehensive process. After I'm finished, um, one of um, the people that I work with will share with me what the plan is for, for this year, you know, because it's fortunately time for us to count again. So we count the attendance the next year. So let's start at the top, and it does share it, um, or it does indicate that the 2017 point in time count was conducted on January 24th of 2017. Um, and there were 654 um, surveys completed for sheltered and unsheltered homeless individuals. Um, to get more detail, um, if you can see, if you look at the census population, in 2007, we had a count of 1,402. That's the top of the right up here at the top. Um, and then you can see incrementally we've had some mostly increases, a little decrease, but the most recent we were at 2,837 people that were either sheltered or unsheltered um, counted during that count. Um, so, you know, a large number of people, and I will say that there, um, people are were counted in almost every community in the county, every area of the county, 
And so this year we're really putting a plug in, I'll do it now, that we want everyone to be involved and everyone to be counted. And um, it's really a good thing because the keep funding, the homeless emergency aid, um, um, homeless emergency aid program funding that's really out there now, a big part of how the money was allocated was based on this, the results of this um, census. So it really does matter, and that's brought in um, uh, a large amount of money to the, to the community, both here at San Benito, um, for us to work with. Um, so looking down below, looking at ages, unfortunately there were 17% of women were under age 18, 16% um, were between the ages of 18 and 24, and 67% were 25 or older. And that there were 61% men, 37% women, 2% transgender. Um, so we look at the different details here, I won't go over every, every detail, but it's important to note that in 2017, 26% of the individuals were considered sheltered and 74% unsheltered. And I wanted to show the definition of sheltered, and that's an individual or family living in a supervised public or privately owned shelter designed to provide temporary living arrangements, such as emergency shelters, transitional housing, hotels or motels paid for by charitable organizations or government entities. An unsheltered is, would be individ an individual or family with a nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designated for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings, including a car, park, abandoned building, bus, or train station, airport, or camping ground. So that kind of helps you understand what, what those numbers represent. Um, I would just um, um, bring, bring your attention to the various details, and it really does demonstrate that the homeless um, individuals reflect, I mean, they're just there from every walk of life, from every corner of the county, every city. Um, it just, it, it's really unfortunately become such a complex issue and a, and a troubling issue. And all of us here are interested in doing better, making it better, figuring out solutions that work for communities and work for the, the homeless. They, they deserve and, um, and would appreciate that consideration. Um, I think. I will stop here. We have a lot to cover tonight. So I think I'm going to turn it over to. <laughs> thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for all being here on this windy, rainy night. Thank you, Henry. And my name is Wendy Askew. I'm with Supervisor James Parker. Um, and uh, bear with us as we work our way through the agenda. We pull a lot of people together um, and want to provide as much information as possible. So, Alex, you're that. To talk about the homeless emergency aid program, which is the funding that's allowing us to sort of uh, create create the, the fire that's getting everyone to start talking. Thank you, Wendy. I'd like to start by thanking Supervisor Jim Parker, Supervisor Adams, and the Community Foundation from Monterey County for hosting this event to discuss potential shelter locations here on the peninsula. So, like they mentioned, I'm a field representative for Assemblymember Mark Stone working in his Monterey office. Um, some members known as currently in Sacramento. My colleague who handles homelessness is out, so I'm here on their behalf. <laughs> as you probably know, HEAT, the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, is a $500 million block grant authorized under Senate Bill 850, which provides direct assistance to cities, counties, and Continuum of Cares, COCs, to address the homelessness crisis in California. The Coalition of Homeless Service Providers, CHSP, is the continuum of care that is in charge of distributing the funds through Monterey, Salinas, and San Benito counties, and has received $12.5 million from the state. 2.5 of this funding will go towards San Benito County, and the other 10 will go toward Monterey and Salinas counties. Lumber, Assembly Member Stone has had a presence within the homeless community since his start as an Assembly Member in 2012. He quickly noticed that Monterey County was, was unique in the fact that a large percentage of the people that are homeless are seniors. During his time in the, in the assembly, he has been a huge foster care advocate and a leader on the issue of continuum, continuum of care. Over the last handful of years, the state has been trying to give local communities power to distribute funds rather than taking a broad statewide approach to homelessness. Assembly Member Stone is looking to hear from the public about their input regarding potential homeless shelter sites and how the money should be spent. I believe. Uh, I am correct that CHSP is currently in the award process and will be receiving grant money in March of 2019. After the funding is distributed, administrative entities must be, must be able to demonstrate that heat funds were expended for three eligible uses. One, contract expenditures. Two, um, 
number of homeless individuals served, and three, programs towards the state goals. The first report is due January 1st, 2020, and then one following the next year, January 1st of 2021. If you have any follow-up questions, I'm more than happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. That's fabulous. And I really am uh, great to have a uh, uh, assembly member Stone supporting the work that we're doing. Um, $10 million isn't a lot of money when you really think about it, but it was enough money to get everyone talking. And that's we're going to move a lot of projects forward. So a couple other pieces of key information since that was one of our, our highlights for tonight. Um, uh, the, the local continuum of care, which is receiving the local money, um, consists of uh, a leadership council through the um, our coalition of public services providers. And I believe that there's information on the uh, one of the flyers that's floating around. And we are short on flyers. I wasn't yeah. expecting flyers to many people. Um, but it has a list of who the membership of that leadership council is. And it does include um, Mayor Joe, and it includes um, Council Member Pacheco, I believe. Uh, there's a handful of uh, Dan Baldwin. Um, uh, so there are a number of people who um, sit on that council. Supervisor Luis Alejo represents the county board of supervisors on that leadership council. So um, although we're invested in seeing uh, solutions and seeing that these funds granted out to the community in a way that can be more significant, um, Jane and Mary, we don't we have to vote. We don't actually have a seat at that table. So um, making sure that you know who does sit at that table and make a decision. They have another meeting coming up. I think another flyer floating around has the date of that meeting and the location of that meeting. Those are all public meetings. Anyone's welcome to participate, um, attend those meetings, um, speak during public comment, share your thoughts. Uh, a couple other pieces, the, the $10 million for homeless projects, there's a, it's fairly broad in scope, but one of the criteria that is eligible is homeless expansion of homeless bed inventory through new emergency shelters, warming shelters, and on and on. So a lot of folks support um, our, our, our homeless services, but increasing shelter space has been one of the bigger challenges that we've um, experienced as we started having this conversation. Our local continuum of care, put, um, I believe that probably 10% of the funds have to be spent on traditional age youth. The state put a minimum of 5%, but our local group has put a, a minimum of 10% of those monies will be spent on uh, traditional age homeless youth age 18 to 24. All right. Um, in order for a, a jurisdiction to receive uh, or be eligible to have shelter space or capital project spent in their city, so we're in the city of Monterey right now, if say the Community Foundation wanted to convert this space that we're sitting in into a shelter, uh, in order for them to be able to, in order for the Community Foundation to apply for that funding, the city of Monterey had to declare a shelter crisis. And so we do have, and I want to recognize the communities in our county who did declare a shelter crisis. Um, and you will note that not all of our uh, cities declared a shelter crisis. So there are cities in our county, in our region, who will not be eligible for um, shelter funds to be spent on capital projects. Uh, the shelter um, crisis was approved by the city of Marina, thank you. The city of Monterey, so we can convert this. Um, the city of Salinas, thank you, Mayor Joe. Um, Hollister, King City, the County of Monterey, so unincorporated property um, or unincorporated areas are eligible. <coughs> San Juan San City, thank you, Marianne. Uh, San Benito County and Seaside, thank you, Seaside. Um, the community, uh, the Coalition for Homeless Service Providers did do a series of outreach meetings in, in <coughs> December, so there was some community outreach that was done leading up to this. Um, where we're at now, they will be putting out an RFP for local entities to apply for those funds. Um, that RFP has not been released yet, but the conversations that we're hearing about lead us to think that there are some folks that are planning to apply for RFP or for HEAP funds, but there isn't another opportunity for them to come back to the public and say, hey, here's what we're talking about, here's what we're thinking about. So this meeting was called so that we could give you all a chance to be aware of the conversations that we're having back at the office day in and day out. Um, yeah, I think those are the highlights for the um, Homeless Emergency Aid Program. Um, if you would like to get more information, you can sign up to receive email alerts from the Coalition. Uh, just go to their website, the information is all on the green sheet uh, on the back. So you can email your information, they'll add you to the mailing list. There's a lot of good information that comes out from the Coalition related to homeless uh, program services, 
generally much better. So with that, I'm going to move right along. We're going to pass this over to Jane or Dan moderating. We can pass it off to Dan. Where are you? Right there. <laughs> you want to moderate for us? Life and shelter. Moderate our time. Um, okay. Well, I'll give you. I'll give you a heads up while you're moderating. So when, next up, we've got our shelter. Um, we've got a couple of our service providers who are with us tonight. Um, these are folks who I've heard about some of the proposals or some of the work that they're doing, um, and they they could potentially be sharing with us some of it for um, their plans to apply for heat funds. The three questions that we've got for them to answer specific to us tonight. Um, where do you currently provide a shelter space or shelter bed? Do you have potential or plans or ideas that you're working on to provide additional shelter emergency homeless shelter beds? Um, and if you have any plans to apply for heat funding and you'd like community support for that, let us know what that is so that we can support you. For about three minutes, five minutes max, and I'm gonna put up some timer signs for you to keep us rolling. And then if you do have questions for any of these, we'll include a Q&A after this that we'll have Dan moderate. <laughs> <laughs> you can just go right down the list. So Jack, you're first up, and you can come up here. Why don't I just bring the microphone to you, unless you have Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my camera can hear you better with a microphone. Yes or no? Please. Yes. Uh, Good evening, my name is Jack Murphy. I'm the Deputy Director of the Veterans Transition Center. Uh, the VTC, as it more commonly known, we're located in Marina. We've been around for a little over 20 years. Uh, most folks know us as an organization that exclusively provides housing and services for homeless veterans. There, there's, that's a lot of what we do. We also serve families. We also serve any veteran in the community. And increasingly, we are wanting to serve the broader community. When we're talking about homeless, I'm talking the non-veteran homeless community. Uh, the I'm very I'm eager to look at the, the point in time numbers that come out, probably about the May time frame. Uh, we expect a drastic drop in the number of homeless veterans in Monterey and San Diego County. Uh, last point in time kind of think we're at 110, but to put that number within a little bit of uh, perspective for you, in the last 24 months, VTC has increased its capacity to house people by over 68%. So we have the ability, we have the talent, we have the know-how to make things like this happen. I'm not a smart man, okay? I'm also really lazy. I spent two decades in the Army. So, so when, when somebody brings me a problem or I see what I perceive as a problem, because I'm not very bright, I normally like look at something and go, okay, so we got an issue with homeless, and that's a empty, vacant house. Hmm, I wonder. And then because I'm lazy, I don't want to do it myself. So I find community partners that will help me, that will collaborate to make a solution come to, to bear. So in, in this little flyer thing that's going around, uh, and I'm, I'm sure, I don't think there's enough for everyone when you told me there were only going to be 15 people here. Uh, <laughs> there's one that's called Martinez Hall Shelter. Okay, Martinez Hall is located off of Infinite Road, so we are in Marina. Okay, beautiful building built in 1941. It has a massive basement. One half is finished. The other half is not. The half that's not finished, we're talking about 8,000 square feet. Okay, uh, it needs a lot of work to get it ADA compliant. We have to do some environmental cleanup type stuff, uh, and then we'd have to kind of flesh it out. But the basics are here. So I'll just run down, uh, for those of you who don't have one of these, who will be located in Marina. And this is just a, a proposal, please understand the proposal. Uh, it's scalable, so if we need more than the 32 beds that are depicted in here, we can do that. If we need less because of the need or the funding, we can do that. Uh, because of how we're kind of configured, uh, we have a big parking lot, uh, some of our facilities are kind of limited, we think something like Martinez Hall would be best suited for a peninsula warming shelter. Oh. Meaning someone comes in at you know, 5 o'clock, we give them meals, they have showers, we have uh, facilities for laundry, storage, there's some case managers, there'll be areas for families, and then at some point in the morning, 7 or so, folks move on and then they come back the next day. Uh, 
practice, best practices, unfortunately, first come, first serve. Um, but that's just sort of best practice, a lesson learned out of the Selena <coughs> Um We would have to outsource meals because it would be generally cost prohibitive based on the configuration of the basement to put in a commercial kitchen. Uh, plus, that would add a lot of overhead. Um, our building is deed restricted. So when we received it from Health and Human Services, they said, great, you can do stuff with it. Don't add another deed restriction to the building. That's not to say we can't use it for a homeless shelter, but we can't add to the deeding uh, that, that we already have in that building. Uh, the federal government will get mad and when they open, they'll take it back from us. Um, we think it'll be about six months to turn the north basement, which is the larger part of the basement, into a shelter. Unfortunately, because this is state money, public money, this is going to be a prevailing wage job. Any capital job that's done with heat money is going to be a prevailing wage. So you take whatever you think it would cost on the Marina on the Monterey Peninsula and add about 35 to 40% to that cost to make a prevailing wage. So sadly, to provide a permanent, robust warming shelter out of Martinez Hall would be close to three and a half million dollars without the program piece. Okay? But that, that's expensive, that's sort of like the optimal. Here's another one that's good enough, okay? The second page there, thank you. You're out of time back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, second page. There are dilapidated, uninhabited houses in the Marina area. Yes. Two of them are on my street with where my housing is. I could partner with the city of Marina. We'll use heat money to rehab those at about 450000 per. Again, it's prevailing weight. Currently, they're vacant, they're dilapidated, they're a risk to the public, they're a risk to the city, they're a hazard, and they're vacant. And there's hundreds of them, but I'm asking for two because they're on my street. It just makes sense. Again, I'm not a bright man. Um, that, that's what I've got. I don't know if we're doing questions afterwards. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Uh, you got to go first before we got our, our system down. So, Carl, unfortunately, she's going to have you more strictly time. Here. So, here's Carl Hall from the city of Cisa. <coughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> 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 um, I'm Carl Hall. I'm the resource management agency director for the county of Monterey. Um, we're currently working on uh, facilities in the city of Salinas and also uh, the city of Seaside. There are <coughs> county properties that have availability. Um, in the city of Salinas, it's vacant land. Um, we're looking at how we would build that, uh, looking at about 10,000 square foot. Um, the current uh, temporary shelter that's um, downtown that we converted the former public defender building is about 8,000 square foot. So we're looking at a pretty good sized building um, where we have our Laurel Yard um, on Laurel Drive uh, near Natividad. Um, another county property that we have is in the city of Seaside that we've been exploring the uh, possibility there. We have an existing 4,300 square foot modular building. Uh, the health department had occupied that. It's been vacant for about 10 years. Um, but my facility folks have been keeping it up. It is. In, in pretty good shape, it would need some insulation, some wiring. Um, Interior-wise, uh, there are exam rooms. It was, it was uh, for the health clinic um, that could be easily converted into family-type rooms. So one of the things that we're, we're doing right now um, is we have an architect that we've gotten on contract. City of Salinas is, is assisting us with that for the, the Salinas facility because we're looking at what it, where is the need? Is it for families? For individuals, um, because there's a little bit different design. You could put men in a dormitory type setting, or women in a dormitory type setting, but the families we we found need more kind of a, like a small room and have some space because you have men, women, and children potentially all together. Um, and so we're we're looking at where is the need and what is that, so we can design the the rooms accordingly. But also, what other types of services do we want to have at those facilities? Uh, showers, laundry, as was mentioned, cooking facilities. Um, those do have costs. Um, and that's one of the things that we need to do in order for, uh, to apply for this heat funding 
is go through that thought process so we get an idea of what the cost is going to be. Get a concept plan so we know what that cost is going to be. So in relation to the, the building, I don't know if I mentioned it, it's about 4,300 square feet. So it's not large. It's about half the size of what we're looking at um, in the city of Salinas. But it is an existing building. It would be an easy tenant improvement. Um, and so it could be, we could meet the tier two year time frame that the heat funding uh, obligates us to meet in order to make that capital expenditure work. Where um, is it? It's, I'm sorry, it, it's uh, behind the social services building at 1281 Broadway, um, the corner of Notre Dame. I see my, my I, I need to wrap up, so uh, if there's any questions, I will answer them once we're done here. Thank you. Uh, for those who are standing, I do want to point out there's, there's a couple of empty seats around. So if you want to move up and get a little more comfortable, there is an opportunity to do that. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Robin McCray. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Robin McCray with Community Human Services, and we operate a program called Safe Place in Monterey. Safe Place serves primarily unaccompanied, runaway, and homeless youth up to the age of 24. Some of our youngest homeless unaccompanied youth are ages 11 and 12. We have currently 12 shelter beds for youth ages 18 to 24 <coughs> upstairs at Safe Place, which is on Pearl Street in Monterey. We recently completed renovations at Sprinkler and ADA Accessible as adequate egress to now be a full-time permanent year-round shelter. There is potential there to increase shelter in the bottom floor, the upstairs. Um, you can go upstairs or downstairs uh, without going outside the building, so we can provide adequate pr uh, precautions or protections between male, female, families, males, whatever. Um, but we could have to find new space for our counseling offices and case management offices nearby. Um, and then um, we are looking at heat money in Salinas, uh, potentially for a drop-in centers, very similar to Safe Place in Monterey. There currently aren't any services for runaway and homeless youth like the kind we provide in, <coughs> in Salinas. And um, the census, um, I'm working with ASI to get the numbers, but there's a significant portion of the 2017 unaccompanied transition age youth were in Salinas. So there's definitely a need. Um, we had a youth advisory board come up with the needs for runaway homeless youth in the county to so have good participation. And one of the biggest needs identified was a drop-in center in Salinas. Um, we are also partnering with, or a potential partnership we're exploring with Gathering for Women. We don't have a sales pitch like Jack, uh, and um, I don't know how many details we can divulge yet, but I will turn the program over just in a minute to Jennifer, and we'll see what she can say. Thanks, Robert. I'm Jennifer Dalton. I'm the Executive Director of Gathering for Women, and we provide supportive services to the homeless women on the Monterey Peninsula. We have a day center located in downtown Monterey. What brought the two entities together is we both have strengths that we bring to the table. We both have had amazing experience with working with the municipality who sees homelessness as a priority in their community. The city of Monterey isn't 100% perfect, but they've been amazing partners. So we created a Housing Insecure Solutions Advisory Committee comprised of board members, um, collaborative partners that we both use as service providers to vet the idea of how together, how can we, gathering for women stay in their lane and providing case management, transportation, supportive services, and uh, community human services who does housing and shelter very well. How do we partner together to provide a community solution? It is going to take a collaborative partnership to provide uh, a solution as a whole. While there's a great need for a women's shelter, a shelter on this side of the peninsula and a women's shelter, we know that a co-ed existing multi-use diverse shelter is the way to go. So we're exploring right now properties in Monterey, Sand City, and Seaside, and we're even open to the county property. Um, more details in a few minutes. Hi, my name is Dorian Manuel and I am here on behalf of Orphan Productions. Um, for those of you that are unaware, Orphan Productions is the uh, 501c3 um, that is heading uh, one Starfish Safe Parking Program as well as the County Safe Parking Program. Um, Michael and Tia are the 
founders and program directors of the um, organization that unfortunately are out of state, so I'm here in that place. <laughs> um, so I've been with Work Productions for around about a year now, and about six months as a case manager for the County State Parking Program. During this time, we've had some um, 14 successfully closed cases for folks in our <coughs> um, getting them back into permanent housing. That is over 20 people simply with the County State Parking Program. Um, for those of you unaware, the County State Parking Program allows folks to sleep in better living in their car, <coughs> to sleep overnight um, and have somewhere safe where they don't have to worry about being harassed, where they have somewhere to use the restroom, somewhere to dispose of their trash, somewhere where they can rest with rest easy without having to stress. And along with that, we also have um, case management, where we work with them to increase their income, help them find health care, and eventually <coughs> help work them into permanent housing, which is our <coughs> ultimate goal. Um, so just through our one program, we've had 14 successfully closed cases of housing, with 13 people receiving assistance in finding work. And currently, we have 100% of people in the county program are either working full time or receiving or applying for uh, SSDI benefits if they are unfit for work. Um, unfortunately, between our two programs, we have a very limited reach. We only have so many spaces available for the folks that need this sort of program. Um, we have uh, lots in Monterey, Pacific Grove, Marina, Carmel Valley, Seaside. And we would really love to open one in Salinas as the biggest influx in phone calls requesting information and service um, that we've ever received was directly after the implementation of the ordinance in Salinas restricting the parking of oversized vehicles on the streets. So there is a definite need for um, accommodation for folks in this situation in Salinas and I believe that if some of these funds are allocated to help me find a program similar to those that we are currently running, we could definitely make a bigger dent in the problem that we're all working on. I'm very honored to be here with all of you and all the different service providers here. We've all been doing wonderful work, and I love every one of you, but there's <laughs> definitely still so much work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we're going to have someone here to speak about eye help. Uh, uh, the yes. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Yes, go ahead. 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 Yes, Interfaith Homeless Emergency Lodging Program. I'm Jan Mason, I'm board secretary, member of the board of IHELP. We've been providing services for 26 years for men. This is shelter, a rotating shelter that goes to different churches each night. Three years we've been serving women. We've served an average of 80 men per year and 90 women per year. Um, we are congregations that house are throughout the Monterey area. We have one in Castroville, two in Marina, four in Seaside, five in Monterey, five in Pacific Road, three in Carmel, five in Carmel Valley, and one in Salinas Highway 68. So we're spread out throughout the area. The different congregations are very important in how this works. They provide the shelter and often the meals that are provided, hot meal every evening. Um, but we have to move the people from church to church. And so we have buses. Those buses transport the people, their beddings and their belongings to whatever church they're going to be at that time. And they pick them up in the morning, load up the buses, store that bedding and belongings on the bus until the next night, where they're going to be at a different church. Um, so that's, that's a transportation intensive program because we don't have one building. We've um, been working for 26 years and we have a lot of support from those congregations. We also have um, other groups that provide food, many rotary clubs um, and other service providers or service clubs in the area and just individuals that have wanted to be part of it. We have a small staff, all part-time, four bus drivers, four overnight monitors, 
and a coordinator for each of the men's program is John Nichols, and for the women's program is Lee Holquist, who both worked for quite a long time in this area with the homeless issues. Um, so as I said, our funding comes from congregations, individuals, especially through Monterey County Gifts. Thank you to the foundation here for making that possible. And grants, um, Fund for Homeless Women, Carmel Rotary, Monterey Peninsula Volunteers Services, Joining Hands, and Delbert Grove have all helped us with that. And the United Way has helped us to get some, some program through the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. But we're not a warming shelter. We have certain expectations for the people who come. Because we are in these churches, we have to respect the church property and some of the, it's not about the religion, it's about taking care of the property. So for everyone's safety, people have to be able to get along with others in the group. And that means they have to be sober when they come to us. And be able to follow the directions and help with like cleanup. Nobody's going to clean up after them when they leave the church in the morning. So we have to leave it clean. Um, and we strive to help them set goals, whatever is appropriate for them, for improving health care, for finding work, finding housing. We have currently about um, five or six of the men working, and I think four of the women working right now. We have a total of about 15 women a night and 20 men a night. Um, and we collaborate with other agencies, with the Salvation Army's Good Samaritan Center and the Gathering for Women. They provide breakfasts and lunch for these folks in the daytime because we're only open at night. And the Veterans Transition Center has provided housing for some of the folks that we've been able to move on to you, which is wonderful. And Cecil, the Central Coast Center for Independent Living, has been able to provide some housing as has Interim that works with people with mental illness. So that's it. We need housing opportunities for where to move these people into after they transition out of us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So we uh, saved the best for last, obviously. Raised. No. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Raise the hand. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity. Uh, as providers, to, to be able to talk about uh, services that we provide. Um, I've been doing this for 17 years. Um, Runaway Homeless Youth was you know, my first project uh, back in 2002. Uh, so. Uh, 17 years of experience. Uh, one of the things that I've found, um, especially in the programs in the last six years you know, in our agency, um, you can provide counseling, you can provide case management, you can provide all these life skills, but if you don't provide housing, there's the success, the, the success rate, the opportunity to transform individuals and families is, is, is challenging. So housing, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, temporary uh, you know, shelter or, or transition housing, uh, the end goal should be uh, permanent housing. And I know that uh, $10, $10 million is not a lot of money uh, to allocate uh, to permanency, um, but I would like to say, as, we, I, as I tell my shelter managers uh, under our programs, and I'll kind of detail some of those programs, but not, not, to, not, to, not to sound bad, but you know, when, when people come into shelters, there's a comfort level, um, but we want to help people transition to the next phase, whatever that phase may be. Um, and so, yes, I hear all this thing about shelters, but I think uh, we as an agency want to, want to be able to offer other, other um, alternatives, and we'll talk about that. Um, so let me just say, uh, today, we offer 304 beds uh, per night uh, on, uh, in, in, in Monterey County and to San Diego County. Um, so in San Diego County, we opened up a, a, a year-round shelter. It's not just a, a, a temporary uh, warming shelter. Back in the days, uh, we you know we used to go from uh, from November to, to March or April. Now it's been, it's kind of been extended to a year-round shelter. So uh, so in San Diego, we have 50 beds. In in, in Salinas, in, in the warming shelter, it's it's unique. Uh, we say 70 beds, but today uh, we get a text that there's a family coming in, uh, not a family of nine. Uh, so what does that mean? 
uh, our, our capacity today would be in the 90s uh, because we don't want people out in the cold um, and especially uh, delicate uh, individuals who sometimes are um, you know, discharged from hospitals, uh, they either go back to the street or they come into the shelter. So, so there's challenges out there um, and as an agency, uh, we want to be able to provide uh, alternatives that make sense. Um, we also have our DV shelters, primarily DV, uh, providing services to survivors of domestic violence. Uh, so we offer 33 beds in Salinas, 16 beds in, 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 in Marina. We also have four transitional housing programs uh, that offer uh, 129 beds uh, to people who are already in that uh, phase where they want to go into permanency. So they're working, they're bringing in money, um, and, and, and going into uh, permanent housing. We, uh, as an agency, have decided that we have existing beds that need to be remodeled. So we're looking for heat funds to do that. Uh, and, and in the peninsula, we have, uh, we have beds here. But we also want to provide um, an Eric, uh, who has been leading the charge uh, as, as a community member, but also as a board member, uh, Tiny Homes. So we're excited about tiny homes. Uh, I know it wasn't a, 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 a topic that everyone wanted to talk about. I'm finally convinced, Eric's convinced me uh, in the last couple of years that tiny homes is, 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 is an alternative. It's not the answer, but it is an alternative to, to homelessness in Monterey County. So we're excited that we're gonna submit applications. For that, we understand that uh, now Seaside is also looking into uh, um, doing a shelter. I, I think we have the experience. I have a background uh, going into 17, 18 years of doing this, um, and uh, we, can, we can offer that expertise as an agency and, and myself as an individual. So thank you, uh, Dan, uh, Dan and County Board of Supervisors, city, city uh, staff, city uh, elected officials. Uh, Joe Gunther and I have gone back six years ago. Uh, he kind of forced me to open up the warming shelter, so. <laughs> but it was a good day, and it's been a good day since the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back to Joe's initial comment, uh, I think I think we owe a round of applause for all the presenters. Um, I wonder if we could just go down the road here and if you would just say where you uh, have or will have um, beds or services in which town or towns would be just helpful for the for people to know what kind of geographic reach we have uh, for um, services that are being provided um, for social services. Um, actually, my role is to help build the facility, design and build the facilities. Um, and if it's on county lands, then that, that's when I would actually be involved. Um, so I, we're, 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 we're looking at a facility in Seaside. We're, we're looking at a facility in, in Salinas. So our 12 beds for uh, transition age OBC are in Monterey, with the potential for expansion of at least 12 more, potentially or so, um, and I'm looking at a partnership with Gathering for Women for um, a shelter um, for both men and women and families in Seaside. So currently, uh, our physical location is in downtown Monterey, but we serve all of the women on the Peninsula cities, and then our expanded outreach services would be specifically for community funds for the homeless women who are living out of doors. There are some and incorporated areas of Monterey uh, is where we focus. Yes, we're, we're in Hollister, um, San, Diego, San Diego County, we have a shelter. Uh, we're also talking about expanding into transitional housing and possibly permanent housing in that county. Um, uh, Hollister has received funds to do some of those things, uh, so we have an interest to do that. Um, of course, you got to fight through our feet. We're, we're also in Salinas. Um, we have our, one of our domestic violence shelters there, obviously the, the, the Mormon shelter. We're also in Seaside and Marina, uh, and the majority of our, our programs are at, uh, in, in Marina. 
Veterans Transition Center is in South Marina, uh, off of Imogen Road. Uh, Martinez Hall is visible from the from Imogen. Uh, and our housing, our, our duplexes, are just on the north side of that, on uh, what's called Hayes Circle, which is uh, in, in that space in between Imogen and uh, where the high school is. The uh, County State Parking Program has a uh, site in Marina, and then One Starfish operates <coughs> with the churches in Seaside, Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel Valley. And Thanks, everyone. So we are going to move into the question and answer time now. So um, you probably saw Wendy moving around, uh, picking up the cards. Um, continue to think of questions and wave the card if, um, so she can see you and she will pick up the cards. Uh, so the first question that I have is for Jack Murphy. Um, how will you transport folks from wherever they are to the Veterans Transition Center? Um, um, so one thing I didn't clarify, uh, because I ran out of time because I talked way too much, uh, the, the duplexes that we are proposing for either reuse that we have now uh, that are under various government contracts that we have to basically avoid, uh, or if we partner with the city of Marina and get more duplexes and fix them up, uh, those I, I would propose the best use of being residential shelters, where somebody would come and stay for approximately 90 days or so. Uh, we got a lot of uh, stability as opposed to an overnight shelter. So if, if it was that type of duplex, that option, I should say, uh, we could pick them up, but they would generally stay there. Uh, shifting gears to a Martinez Hall type uh, overnight shelter, warming shelter, whatever you want to call it, uh, VTC has vehicles now uh, that were funded through Measure X. We're very grateful for that. We've got buses and vans. Uh, we have thought about partnering with uh, IHL, other organizations who are already doing that anyway, and they could come to Martinez Hall and drop off, or we could somehow come up with our own uh, transportation uh, schedule and network with existing vehicles. Like I said, we already have vehicles from Measure X, and we can actually purchase a couple more. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, will heat funding be allocated strictly through the Leadership Council? So, um, like I said, uh, Catherine Tierney with the Coalition of Public Service Providers, um, the information is on the handout. It's really the best one to direct questions like that to. But in general, the process for allocating the heat funds will be determined by the Leadership Council. So whether the Leadership Council is the one making those decisions, or whether they're assigning those decisions to some sort of group or um, entity, uh, it will be the Leadership Council who has uh, responsibility for making uh, determining the process by which heat funds are allocated. And our next meeting is January 23rd. 23rd. January 23rd, 1 o'clock. Um, so anyone who wanted to weigh in could read the packet, all the information is online. Um, but they, those are the folks who are deciding the process. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, for each of the organizations, we'll start at this end this time. Um, um, who are you? your organization, who are you accountable to, and do you receive any public funding? Um, we are the County Safe Parks Program section yes. of Work Production is funded through uh, the Department of Social Services, um, and One Starfish is largely funded through grants, uh, but we are largely overseen by uh, Department of Social Services, and they give us a lot of really wonderful uh, guidance and how to improve our program over the course of our operation. Okay, so our funding, as I mentioned um, in my overview, comes from a lot of um, local congregations, individuals, and local small grants. And um, we do get some funding through the United Way that is speeding up funding through the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. I am on the board of directors, so yes, we are the board of directors, and we are at 501c3, and we've been effective for four years previous to that. We were under the Shelter Outreach Plus Community Homeless Solutions umbrella until the federal funding ran out, and we had to become separate. So we are a 501c3, and we do have a board of directors. So. 
Veterans Transition Center is a 501c3. We have a board of directors. We're coming on our 21st year. Um, we, we have both emerg well, we have emergency residential shelters, we have a shelter, we have uh, permanent supportive housing, we have transitional housing. I say that because all those different programs are funded in different ways. <coughs> Predominantly, we're VA funded. We also have HUD funding. Uh, we have funding through the Community Foundation. We uh, leverage uh, community development block grants from the city of Seaside, city of Monterey, uh, county of Monterey. Um, I think I'm missing one. Oh, state, of state of California. So we kind of have many matters, uh, but uh, we try to make everyone happy. Uh, we're, we're a nonprofit, 501c3. We do have a, a, a board of supervisors, I mean, uh, board of directors. Um, so I always say 75, 25, 5. So I mean, 70, 25, 5. 70 uh, percent of our of our funding is uh, government, whether it's local, state, or federal. Uh, 25 percent of it is uh, private, uh, you know, private foundations, and then 5 percent fee for service and uh, donations. Gathering for Women is a 501c3 nonprofit. We have been in existence for five years. We do have a governance board of directors. <coughs> our current operating budget is $852,000. Uh, majority of our funds come from private donation, and then our diverse portfolio includes grants. And then we have a small, a nice size, but small, considerably, uh, uh, contract with the county through the community action partnership and a $9,000 uh, CDPG block grant from the city of Monterey. Um, I report to the board of directors. We have an outside audit annually and we use the firm currently of Bianchi, Castleman, and Pope. Um, and the heat funding that we would be applying for would be expanded services because that's a requirement. So it's outside of our general operating budget. Uh, community Human Services is also a nonprofit five c 3 2019, we're marking our 50th year of service to Monterey County. Um, I've been doing human services at Community Human Services for 26 years, about 30 altogether in the nonprofit world. Um, so I'm accountable to my board, and my board is comprised of representatives from 15 cities and school districts, because in addition to being a 501c3, we are a joint powers agency. So that makes us quasi-governmental, which means we not only have an independent audit at the same time that a 501c3 does, but we're held to uh, a government accounting standards as well. So we're accountable to the Secretary of State, just like all of the nonprofits are, and then we're accountable to all of our funders. So that includes individual donors. We think we are good stewards of their donations. We're accountable to HUD and HHS for homeless uh, service grants, um, to community foundation and other private foundations to the Monterey County uh, departments such as social services, probation, and behavioral health with which we have numerous contracts for services. So we've been around the block a few times and we have so many masters it's not fun. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, great, thank you uh, for those. Um, so one question here is, um, any plans for LGBTQ shelters? Uh, to serve um, uh, gay uh, youth or adults in any of the programs? Uh, not specifically, but our programs are very LGBTQ <coughs> friendly with special rainbow groups for counseling and case management. Um, and we do um, have mental health uh, group uh, groups with rainbows over Seaside and rainbows over Salinas. So we're very inclusive of the LGBT community in all of our services, including our shelter. As are, as, as are we, so, yes. Thank you. Um, let's see. So, uh, have your organizations or local governments partnered, pursued partnership with local foundations, businesses, or other sources of private match funds? I kind of feel like with all those masters, we heard some of that. Anything, um, anything further you want to say about uh, some creative ways that you found to maximize donations? Uh, in terms of government partnerships, um, we will be talking to the Health Department's Behavioral Health Division to see if we can maximize mental health services in the shelter, something that Jennifer and I believe in very strongly that there has to be a strong mental health component 
in homes programs and in shelters because they're right there you have access to individuals who might need those services so that's something that we're exploring and then just the partnership between gathering for women and community human services we want to model partnership and model collaboration uh, this may be a project that neither of us could complete individually but together we think we have all the strengths to do a really good job we also have um, two private donors that have come to gather and saying we want you to help build a shelter. However, our mission is very focused. We provide supportive resources as a day center. We do case management. We provide day services. So um, we've brought the donor to the table who can really help us leverage. We, as an organization, aren't dependent on one type of funding. This HEAP funding is a one-time deal. So the project that we need to move forward has to be and not dependent on one funding. Um, so, as I said, transitional housing is one of our one of our biggest programs in our agency. As you know, there's a government shutdown, so uh, there's no resources or money coming in uh, from from that funding source. Uh, so, uh, as I as I talked to Catherine uh, with the coalition, it, it may not just be 30, 60, 90. It could be longer as they're going to be backlogged. Uh, and so that, 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 that's, that's a hurt for us as an agency. I had a foundation from out, outside this area. I won't mention their name. But uh, you know, they are funding us. But one of the things she said was, and interesting, uh, she left me thinking after, after our meeting, uh, you, know, you guys get close to $3 million a year, but you're providing all these services. So, there is, I mean, so we're not receiving what we should probably be receiving with all the uh, services that we're providing. So, um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, when we used to do I Help um, and our Salinas Warming Shelter and San Benito, we're not getting enough funds to, to provide meals. And so, what do we do? We have to partner with with churches or other community members to, to help us provide a warm meal every night. So, uh, we're doing everything we can with this with the resources we have, but we're also trying to think outside the box. How can we make this work? I, I just want to add, there, there's, there's two components here. There's getting the facility built, and then there's operating it. And the heat funding is really just to kind of the short term, get something up and running. So there still needs to be discussion about, if there's a facility, how it operates long term. That, that's going to be something that's going to need to be addressed. Now, I'll just keep backing on that. And I have a whole question, too, that kind of touched on this. Yep. But um, on the... On the, the green sheet that you have, it talks about what the heat money is. And a couple of the, the highlights here, 50% um, of the awarded funds must be contractually obligated by January 20th. That's a year from now. January 2020, sorry. That's a year from now. So the funds will be obligated for a project ready to go. And 100% of the funds must be expended by June 30th, 2021. So really really short timeline for these kinds of projects. <coughs> That's a really short timeline to try to go out to the community and say, hey, these are homeless shelters that we're talking about putting in your backyard. Um, you know, let's go through a let's go through an end of the process. So there's this, you know, balancing act that's happening right now. Um, also just to reiterate that heat funds are considered a one time only opportunity unless we can all call um, Mark Stone's office and let like, <laughs> like more money. Um, I'm not counting on it though. And then the last piece here um, around community engagement, there's a lot of questions about community engagement, um, both for the peninsula, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, but a lot of questions about Salinas. Um, community engagement, there was an effort made to solicit input from the community um, around the HEAP project. I'm just reading straight off of what the coalition provided us. Community engagement reports can be found online on our website. And I know we were short on these flyers, but we will, and then, Posted up here as well. Um, but if you make sure that your uh, contact information is clear on the sign in sheet, I will send out digital copies of everything that was distributed tonight. So if you didn't get a copy and you want to get it, you're going to be able to I just want to kind of clarify something. Well, Wendy said that 50% of the, of the funds must be encumbered by, I think it was January 2020. The application process is going to start in a few months. So nonprofits, providers, such as myself and everyone else at this table and others, we've got to write up the prospectus and apply. Uh, talking to Catherine at the coalition, 
a couple days ago, she's thinking about the April time frame as Senate to the state. So yes, some of these programs, some of these proposals are 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 contentious. They you know you're getting your NIMBY hat on, you don't want it done in your city. Well, I get it. There's no optimal solution. But here's a chance where the state has said 12.5 million, do whatever you want, but solve the problem. Start doing something. And we can talk about this to we're blue in the face. We don't have a lot of time to find solutions. It might not be the optimal, it might not be the perfect one, but we all care about the community. You care too, and that's why you're here. We could we could infight this thing all day long, we could block it, we could go to court, we could throw zoning laws up, whatever, and, and nothing will get done. Which is an alternative to do nothing. But I don't think you guys want that. Uh, you mentioned, I'm sorry, Mark, I'm going to continue to answer. I do hope I can do this without offending Jack, because you're a good friend. Uh, the applications that are submitted locally do not have to go to the state. You chose a second option, and that was for the continuum to apply to the state. The continuum did receive approvals, so $12.5 million is on its way to Henry. So, we'll apply to the continuum. Yes, we will apply to the continuum in the Leadership Council and make those decisions. I can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks. So, um, kind of related to the whole timing uh, issue is, um, the question is, how quickly can you open bed or expand the, the capacity? So, um, let's just say that your proposal is, uh, is chosen and funded um, in whatever it is, March or April, um, how quickly could you have the beds or the expanded services um, ready to go? Um. It kind of depends. I mean, if you have, if you have, like, you know, the one at Seaside, the facility for the county that we have, the one at Seaside, you have an existing building, the tenant improvement can be done pretty quickly. Um, within six months, you could have people that could be in beds. Um, the facility that we're looking at in Salinas, that's raw dirt. That's going to take more time because they have to, to do all the site preparation and, and construct. Well, you know, going out to bid, they take um, but in the, in the case with Salinas, we do have a temporary facility that we are, do have beds open right now until to, to try to, to brace that gap. So we're trying to get the facility built as quick as we can and not have downtime in between that. Um, and I just also want to add, while I'm out, while I have mine, um, is that this, these facilities aren't intended to be the end all are going to solve everything. This is the first step. This is this is to kind of get things rolling. Um, there's been mention of other types of housing. Um, we have been in conversations with the city of Salinas. There's another site for potentially for housing that we'd be able to, to transition people to. So there are more things that would have to occur, um, but this is just to get us started. Uh, in, in, excuse me. In Monterey, if we expanded the shelter beds at Safe Place. We could be open within 30 to 60 days, and I say that confidently because four years ago when we first opened the shelter, we got a conditional use permit and we opened the shelter within about 40 days. Wow. So when there's political will and there's energy within an agency or organization to get it done, you can move quickly. Um, uh, in uh, a project with uh, Gallery for Women, it depends on the site that we select. One of the ones we would be considering is the seaside, so that would be fairly quick as you just heard uh, my site. And the dependency is on the municipality. So I'm confident uh, all of my colleagues and I could deliver upon the word that we're committing to a timeline, but we can't do anything without a municipality <coughs> saying, yes, you can. And we can't do anything without the neighbors in that neighborhood being brave and inclusive. So yes, we are great, and you should fund every single one of us and support us. <laughs> However, it is about inclusion. And so I can't wait to congratulate. I will personally write a handwritten note to every neighbor that is brave enough to host something in their backyard. Yes, uh, for, for remodeling some of our existing um, 
housing, uh, I, I said two to three months, maybe four, um, just because we have to remodel some of those. Um, with tiny homes, that's a good question because we're going to meet with the city of Marina tomorrow. Uh, this is this is kind of new uh, to to um, you know the Marina in terms of tiny homes. We want we, we want a small uh, pilot project uh, to see if, if that works. Then we'd like to see uh, you know other locations. Um, so. We, we don't really know yet, but we're hoping easy be, before the uh, the two years. Um, if everything goes well with the city, then then, then that can be a lot sooner. Um, but we don't know yet. For the Veterans Transition Center, if we had to uh, essentially repurpose an existing duplex that we have, probably about a month, uh, to rehab something that is vacant and uninhabitable now, it's about a three to four month. Uh, the rehab, uh, to do something large like Martinez Hall, we're talking six to eight months. If we were to work alongside um, churches and use, and use their uh, facilities for a place for a safe parking program, it would just be a matter of finding a church that would be willing to work with us, which really shouldn't be too hard. Um, so at, <laughs> once we'd be able to do that, it would just be a matter of training um, a caseworker for the program, and I would believe we'd be able to get it up and running within a month. We might know we don't have a way to really increase the capacity of the different churches we rotate to. What we would like to do is be able to increase the number of successful transitions from our shelter out into other housing. And so we would like to hire a part-time social worker and housing specialist to be able to work with the men. We've already got a grant from Fund for Homeless Women to do some of this with the women, but we need a parallel one to work with the men. Thank you, Thank you everyone. So um, this is an informational um, it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. Just a piece of information in regards to the availability of buses. Monterey Salinas Transit has a surplus of vehicles that you can sign up for. NSC is purchasing electric buses and can donate vehicles to nonprofits. And I saw something just today that they're sort of suggesting too that um, they would donate buses to nonprofits uh, to be turned into some sort of shelter um, if, if you're interested. So MST can be considered a, a resource. Um, so, uh, Mayor Gunter, we have a couple of questions. This is about Peninsula, but we do have some people here who have some interest uh, and concerns about um, things in Salinas, so I thought we'd just kind of ask you to speak briefly. Um, so, um, uh, why has Salinas been credited with best practices? There was little to no transparency. Um, the homeless, um, about the East Salinas um, shelter. Uh, oh, homeless shelters are planned for East Salinas uh, next to two jails and the soccer fields, uh, far worker communities, so some concerns there. Um, yeah, that's the basic uh, concern. And let's see, on the other one, uh, yes, why did the supervisors dump this uh, location near schools, parks, soccer field? Um, neighborhood. Uh, a lot of neighbors are objecting. Sure. First of all, the supervisors worked with us in trying to find a location and went throughout the city. I know a lot of people don't think we've knocked on enough doors. We have. We know we have limited time. We're also aware of where the location would be. And it isn't a plan to have the people there. Wandering the streets has been said. They will be there to get into transitional housing, have programs. And the supervisors did not dump this in East Salinas. There are not two jails, there's a juvenile hall. But we have young people that we're trying to get rehabilitated. So that information is not correct. It's close to the hospital, it's close to the social services, it's close to the health department. And can I finish? Thank you. And it also provides an opportunity for both of the school districts where these young children are going to school for them to be picked up and taken to school so they can further education. And as our friend said that runs the shelter tonight, he has a family of nine coming in. That's a lot of children that need a place and I think we are pushing hard and we are continuing to look for additional facilities. 
farm workers are not busy. Thank you. Um, Monterey County, the Monterey County Housing Authority is a one-stop office full of accountants, lawyers, social workers, etc. Why doesn't the county have the authority to manage all your housing needs, including private sector inclusionary units? There's a question. Um, anyone care to? Um, you know, it's a good it's a good question. The challenge for us at the county is that the housing authority is separate. Uh, from us, so um, not that we couldn't partner, but I think that's a good question to take back and explore uh, what the possibilities are for uh, more collaboration um, and closer working relationship. Uh, a question for the organizers of tonight's forum. Can we formulate a directory listing each of the agencies present tonight uh, as an emergency contact network with information on services available. Um, yes, we can. Um, and if you are interested in having that list, um, if you would make sure that you note that on the sign-in sheet um, or hand us uh, one of the question cards, uh, we can make sure that you're on the list for that. Um, then question, um, is any nonprofit or NGO addressing the housing obstacles of no transportation and no money for moving costs. Oh. So our partnership that we're exploring uh, does just that. You know, how do uh, let's just say the women and men that we're going to serve get from their locations to the shelter, and then if the shelter is just an evening shelter, how do they get from the shelter to their place of work, or their day center, or their rehabilitative services. So that's where the partnership comes in. We provide those services, so it be expanded services. So uh, we, we've learned a lot from working with the VA and VA partners. So the VA, uh, starting in about 2012, 2013, has made a tremendous effort at, at solving veteran homelessness, and a lot of those uh, lessons are very applicable to, to working with the non-veteran homeless community. Uh, with regard to vehicles, uh, we have vehicles at BTC. Uh, we help people move in, we help people move out. We've got a big box truck that's kind of being taped together, but it, it works for us. Uh, and, and we help others in the community do that as well, and we would continue that process. Uh, I mentioned uh, it, the VA earlier because there's a wonderful program called SSVF, uh, Supportive Services for Veterans and Families. Part of what they do is provide the, the essentially the cash up front for people to pay security deposits and, and uh, your first month's rent. I mean, around here for a single bedroom, we're talking five thousand dollars. And if you're coming out of homelessness and somebody wants first and last, no one has five k. So there are programs out there uh, and uh, that that help with is the rental assistance um, throughout the heat kind of concepts discussions. Uh, that came to the top as one of the, the high priority things that we should look at funding with HEAP is something like rental assistance. Uh, but there is a, a very limited amount of affordable housing in Monterey County. Uh, we have vouchers and we don't have very many places to take that, that or landlords that take vouchers. So making our landlords and our property managers smarter on the programs and making them understand that you know, these are folks who just might be income limited, but they're not <coughs> wackos, uh, and they should take vouchers, and there's case management that comes with that. That would be very helpful as well. Uh, currently, uh, at our shelters at, uh, where we provide services to uh, survivors of domestic violence, uh, we, bought, we purchased a van uh, through state funding, so we had that opportunity. In San Benito County, we got a donation from the county uh, for a van to, to pick up. Uh, the homeless and, and bring them into the shelter. Um, in transition to housing, 99% of, uh, of our, our participants uh, have own uh, or access right down the street uh, public transportation. Um, so it's independent. But we do, when they're in the in initial uh, entry, uh, we do get donations. We receive donations from community members. So, so we're grateful for that, where we provide uh, bus passes. Uh, from you know from, from the beginning of their entry um, in Salinas because we're still in the city uh, access to services is a lot easier but in, 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 when when that <coughs> happens 
there will, there, there will be need, a need for transportation, whether we are the entity or whoever assumes uh, that, uh, that responsibility and that contract, uh, transportation will be needed. I'd like to give a plug to the lead agency in Monterey County that does homeless prevention and rapid rehousing, and that's a Housing Resource Center, and you can go on their website to learn more about the services that they offer. Yes. Did you have a question? Could you write it on the card? <laughs> I want to add another resource that we haven't talked about that about, and that is 211, which is a, a really robust database that has so many different services, particularly for uh, for homeless uh, programs. And I see Katie Castagna from United Way is here that has done a lot of work uh, in this field, but specifically 211 is a really good opportunity when you have people that need funding for bus passes and that sort of thing. There are that there are those kinds of, uh, of programs available. Thank you. This whole the question of transportation is one um, I think there's two people that are holding that card. Um, uh, transportation is a question that we've gotten uh, you know multiple times up here so <coughs> and we all know that is one of the the um, great obstacles. Um, so question is there still an opportunity for cities that haven't declared a shelter crisis to get on board? And um, maybe Wendy, could you answer the question about whether cities that haven't declared a uh, shelter crisis could still? Sure. So it's a really good question. It's a question that I asked uh, Catherine Terry this morning when we were on the phone. She didn't have a clear answer for me at that point. So um, I, I think that the cities of Pacific Grove and Carmel could still take action to declare shelter emergency, and then the coalition could determine what steps they would need to take to let that state know about that. Um, there's nothing preventing them from declaring a shelter emergency. Uh, there's a really simple template document, um, and it's possible that if they, they did do that, there would be the opportunity to submit that documentation to the state, and then they could allow, uh, you know, we're talking about, for instance, the state parking program. If they're wanting to expand in Carmel or Pacific Grove where they have locations, um, it would limit what they can do, so um, it's not too late. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's not too late. Which, which means what she's really saying is if you live in Pacific Grove or Carmel, you should go to your city council um, and tell them uh, yeah, that would be a good idea. And if you need the template to give to them to make it really easy for them, um, if you uh, if you let uh, you give Wendy, you know, write it on a card, put it on the sign in sheet, if you make sure we know that, we will get the template to you. Um, question, could MPC host a safe parking program maybe 7 to 7, oh yeah, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, with funding from local government, CBG, General Fund, Community Foundation, help? Yuri, I think maybe that's you. <laughs> well, that's a really interesting question. So, um, I'm newly elected to the MPC board and having gone to one official meeting, but one of the meetings, maybe this isn't a conversation we've been having, but it's certainly one that I'm willing to introduce. So I know when Mary hosted a meeting in Monterey, it came up that MPC used to offer some services around the campus, so I'm willing to ask a question and see if we can do something different. Speaking for MPU, I see I know how many of you saw the students that came out, and if you see, we're looking at Approximately 10, Monterey, Seaside, Marina, 10% of our students are uh, designated as homeless. There are some different definitions that are used for when we talk about homelessness, but um, regardless, 10% of 800 students come to school every day without having come from a bed of their own and a home to their own. We need to do more. Thank you. Um, to the electives in the room, how do you make the decision to allow a shelter in your city? <laughs> Might as well let the game trip walk Get it started. You almost made it out the door. I think the, what makes the decision is when you drive around your neighborhood and you see people sleeping on the curb, sleeping in shopping carts, sleeping in doorways. You run into a family that's sleeping in the van in the parking lot of uh, one of our grocery stores, and I went over and talked to them, and they said, we have no place to go. That's when you make the decision. I've heard that 
and I'm this big, soft hearted guy that wants to help the homeless people, help kids. And if people in this room don't like that, they're right, I do. Because no kid should have to sleep in a van. And tonight, if you need to, turn off your heaters and go out and sleep in your cars and then tell me not. you don't want them in your neighborhood. Right, but you'll tell them. That's right. Thank you. So, um, all right, uh, Mayor Carbone? You gotta be hard. That's a hard, hard question for my lips, Eddie, uh, because we don't have that much area. Uh, but I uh, did want to show interest, and I invited uh, Anthony. Uh, with uh, the Salvation Army because I do see a lot of homelessness coming through our city and uh, a lot of services are provided to, to homeless and uh, I come over to the Salvation Army and uh, if he wants to model and come help serve the homeless as, as well as, you know, working at the food bank, handing out food. There's a lot of different uh, things that you can see in the community. So as far as our city, I don't know that. Well, you were on the city council, right, when the Salvation Army um, came in. Yes. Um, how, uh, what was the discussion? Do you remember how difficult was that to make that decision? It wasn't uh, difficult for me because I'm out in the community and I see the, serve the needs in our community. So uh, I'm a community person and uh, now uh, we welcome the Salvation Army to good services, and I believe that a lot of the other cities on the peninsula do uh, take their hats off for the city, uh, allowing. Even though we we may have a hotel coming in next door to the Salvation Army, we are not going to have the Salvation Army move. So uh, uh, I stand firm as uh, being the mayor, Sam City. Uh, that's a, a valuable service, and we're really proud to have them offer those services out to the homeless and families uh, during the holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, representatives from Seaside want to say anything about how you're uh, thinking about making those kinds of decisions? Um, <laughs> Big strong advocates for uh, having Seaside be a uh, place that welcomes yeah. solutions. Um, so I had kind of back and forth, you saw with me trying to be respectful of the senior member on our, on our council and not, uh, you know, waiting for him to take the reins, so to speak. But, um, you know, much to Mayor Gunther's point and um, Mayor Carbone's point. Um, so I used to be a uh, deputy sheriff in San Diego County, and um, I remember one night I went to a uh, call, and as I was leaving, there was a, a car with foggy windows, it was moving, and you, know, you suspect what you suspect, and you see that kind of thing. And I knocked on the window, and the window came down, and it was a car packed full of people, a uh, middle-aged man, middle-aged woman, and two children. And I asked them what they were doing, and they said, we are homeless, we're sleeping in our car, and we stay here in the Jack in the Box parking lot because it's well lit and you know it's safe. We don't have to worry about people coming by and bothering us and and except for the sheriff. Sure. Um, and so um, you know, I just I felt I felt bad that that they they thought they were most safe in a jack in the box parking lot and not somewhere where they didn't have to pay to go to the bathroom that just so happened to be open 24 hours throughout the night and. You know, what are those kids doing? How are they studying? How are they getting cleaned up for school? Are they being bullied in school because they can't get themselves clean? What does that do to their ability to learn? What does that do to the parents' spirit when they struggle because they're feeling they can't provide for their children? And it's just this, this ongoing cyclical, it just hurts everybody. And the answer is not to, to push it somewhere else. The answer is not to say, I don't want to see that. Or, we're all human beings and we all have to work together to make our society a better place. And, um, you know, I, I don't mean to, to say it in a boastful way, but, but I'm privileged enough to own a home and um, we're going to try to convert our garage into a brand new unit because we want to help our neighbors and, um, you know, we're not 
we live in Seaside, so it's you know going to be twenty five hundred dollars a month for our four hundred square foot brand new. But you know it won't be free either. But we're not looking to maximize profits. We're going <coughs> to pursue a Section Eight program, a housing transfer voucher program, because okay. part of the solution in our community, and not yes. expecting somebody else to finally fix it. Thank you, Council Member. Um, uh, Council Member Berkeley, you want to speak um, from your perspective about what we have? Council Member Pacheco, did you want to say anything? Sure. Um, Marina is very much involved and concerned about the issues of homelessness in our city. We've been doing a lot of work with Lapis Road and it's something that we speak regularly about. However, one of the things that we're acutely aware of is that this is a county issue, mm -hmm. and we're very, very committed to working with the county to figure out the best solution. And I'm not sure that we've really hit on that yet. What I can say is that, as a, as a city, and certainly personally, we're very, very committed to finding a long-term solution. So just keep it short, because I know time is going. Thank you. Just a very brief story on Mr. Wizard. I used to work for the Old Myers Center and be part of a uh, nutrition program. And there was a homeless guy that was there for years, and he was a volunteer. And two, three years, he was really active. And three or four days, he didn't show up. And the staff person and myself said, where's he at? And then we found out that he was parked in front of a house in a seaside on the street. So they said, they could go over there. I chose to go over there. We knocked on the window, figured he was asleep. We killed the door. Found out later that he died on uh, like a January, February time period. And ever since that time, it was an issue. Um, that was kind of something that you don't forget. And uh, but what me and Councilman Wilson are working on, uh, those Eastside residents are here. I think community input is important. And on February 13th, we are hosting a. Uh, Town hall meeting uh, to get residents input, and I think that's vital as well. So I think Councilman Wizard and myself both aware of the need for homeless, but we also aware that the community needs to be invested, and part of that what we're doing as quickly as possible to get in that input so we can move forward positively for the city of Seaside. Thank you. Yes, February 13th. Wednesday, Old Myers Center, 6 p.m. Um, that's pretty much it. It should be simple, few speakers. Bottom line, we're looking for community participation more than us talking. Hey, everybody. everybody's, everybody's welcome with that from all the communities. It's not just for Seaside. And we'll have uh, Henry Espinosa, um, Carl will probably be there, and uh, Nick Chulos, also the Assistant County Administrative Officer, to kind of give an update about what's happened between now and that meeting on February 13th. Um, specifically with the site and seaside, but also generally in, um, in this heat kind of conversation. Thank you. Um, this has been a really productive discussion. There are a couple more questions. Uh, I know uh, Sam Farr uh, has something else he'd like to say, and then um, Supervisor Adams is going to um, uh, go through a list of ways that you can stay involved and engaged. Um, so there's a question here about um, are sweeps and vehicle tows going to remain the established actions of law enforcement before programs are implemented? Um, and I'll just say quickly, um, this was for all the electeds, but um, we're running low on time. And I will just say from my perspective at the county, um, one of the things, one of the reasons that we started the safe parking program in front of my office was because we had uh, an issue where people were parking out on Lapis Road and um, and the county staff um, asked me, you know, well, volunteered to put up the parking signs and enforce the no parking. And I said, well, but where are people going to go? We can't we can't tell them no parking until we have an actual place where people can park. So this, that's how we got to the safe parking program. It doesn't serve. Still doing that. Uh, there are not very many participants who who are um, uh, living in their large in the larger vehicles in the recreational vehicles. So we still need to be working on a solution for um, folks who, um, you know, they may not be looking for 
any other form of housing. They have their home, they just need a safe place to put it. So um, but that still is um, a, an area that uh, needs some work. 24 hours so, a day. Um, thank you. I'll ask um, Sam Farr to come up and um, say what he has to say. And Jane, I'll just say there were more comment cards. I tried to yes. do one for the like, multiple ones with a similar issue. So if you have questions that didn't get answered, please, please let us know. We'll get information back out if you have questions that didn't get answered. Well, thank you, Jane. I, I just want to admonish that this is really serious because the state legislature can take all kinds of actions. And what they're considering now is that if communities don't solve these housing problems, they're going to give the developers a right to build whatever they want as long as it meets code. And that's building codes, not zoning codes. And they'll and pay a fine instead of 30% housing. You don't think that they can't do something. Look at our water situation. We're under what we call cease and desist orders. The state can order that you fix the problem or we're going to just cut it off. And the monies that the cities get and, and, and are passed on to the nonprofits. So we have to, as a, as a community, take this responsibility that we're not going to allow the Navy. I'm going to farm out. I'm going to go admonish that city council that if it doesn't start building housing, I'm going to urge that they sue the city so it stops every permit that's ever given. Because this is really serious. We're destroying our towns if we don't take care of our people. So for those of us that care about our communities and the history that we built here, we have been an area that solves problems, and those problems have become models for the state and the nation. And we ought to be able to seize that opportunity here with all the land we have at Fort Ord and land we have in other areas. And I would think that all of our governments, not just the, you can't blame it on the counties or the cities, all the, all the governments. Our schools ought to be looking at excess land and putting teachers in there. We are, we are. Yeah, we're doing that. Right? <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank you for having this meeting because if we don't vet these things and get, get it clear, uh, we can't give the political support to those people that have the guts to get out and do it. So thank you very much, and I appreciate you running me. Thank you, Sam. If Sam is someone who just does not take no for an answer. When it comes to these issues that are so important for the community, um, we do have one last question that's addressed to Mary and me, and that is, why is the Peninsula Shelter so important? So I will say, um, in addition to all of the reasons that we've heard about tonight, uh, one of the things that shows up in the homeless census is that um, the vast majority of people who are currently homeless um, and are in a particular city are from that city. And so I think it's very important that, um, that uh, Salinas have a shelter. We need at least one on the peninsula as well for our residents. Absolutely, I forget, and I can tell you as well, for 14 years, United White Co. sponsored the homeless shelter. So we were intimately involved, we participated in the shelter, 4 o'clock in the morning. But what we saw, the census, what am I saying here? The census, sorry, the census, the homeless census. But what we saw is that from every other year to every other year, the populations would swing. The numbers would be higher in Salinas, and then two years later, they would be higher on the peninsula. And we're kidding ourselves if we think that there is not a homeless problem on the Monterey Peninsula because there absolutely is. Anyone who goes down on the rec trail knows that there is a homeless issue on the peninsula. There are so many hidden faces of homelessness. There are so many women who just look just like the rest of us, and they are living in their cars. This gives me a great opportunity to talk to you about the homeless census and to see if we can seek volunteers to participate in the homeless census. It's going to be January 31st this year, and Gloria in the back of the room has a list that has the training dates um, that are available. I can tell you it's an experience that you will not forget. It's a wonderful, heartwarming experience. The other thing is, yes. That, excellent. I hope I don't know if you heard that, but if you cannot get to training because you are working, you can watch it on YouTube and that will give you enough information to be able to participate. There are several ways that you can stay involved with this now. I'll just give you a couple. This is a questionnaire that we're hoping everyone will complete. You can notice it by its rather brilliant line color. Um, so please complete this. It's, it will give us good information for us to consider. And you have an opportunity to um, either mail it back or you could um, 
complete it now and hand it in. I believe it will work out just fine. Uh, additionally, I, I want to tell you that the next Leadership Council meeting is going to be January 23rd at uh, Martinez, uh, the Martinez Hall, uh, on, just on the engine, and at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. And my hope is that if you're interested in this, you may want to think about attending one of the Leadership Council meetings. Um, another thing that we want you to do is, um, if you would consider, if you live in Pacific Grove or Carmel, if you would consider speaking to either your city council or your mayor, and encourage them to declare a homeless crisis within their cities, I think it would really be helpful. Because for all of us, if we're able to show that all of the cities on the Monterey Peninsula acknowledge the awareness that we have a homeless crisis, I think it will help us in the applications and the work that we can do uh, further. Uh, the last thing again is, um, this was put in as a joke, and I'm not so sure I'm going to read it, but <laughs> one of the things that we get accused of on the Monterey Peninsula is that we are great big nindies, not in my backyard. And I think each one of us needs to walk out of this room with the real commitment to be a yimby, yes, in my backyard. When we held our, uh, the District 5 office held a homeless uh, meeting in Monterey at the library, and there was a group of people who were so adamant, so supportive of what we were talking about, that I had said that you can't solve the problem as long as you view homeless people as the homeless. You have to look at them. You have to look at their faces. You have to see them as people. And the people who were in this lovely neighborhood up in the Montericcio neighborhood of, uh, of Monterey were saying, we want to bring them into our homes. We want to include them in our lives. Because until we take that bold step, we aren't going to normalize and bring people back in. There are so many good things that have been said this evening. I think there's a lot of good work that's ahead. I think we just have to make the decision that we're going to resolve this. Just as Sam said, we have a reputation for getting things done in Monterey County. This is not rocket science. We can do it. And I'll thank you so much. Thank Jane Parker so much for organizing all of this. Thank you for your time. And Dan, thank you for your hospitality and the leadership that you so strongly need. And all this comes with that. And they're not, that's not the even address that I can tell. And I just wanted to make sure that if you're going to address the issue, this, these issues need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be safe out there. And while you're with you.